uh, to go ahead and call together, call us together for our July 27th, 2022, the left two board meeting. All right, looking at our agenda, we have a few things to accomplish. Uh, thank uh, all of you for being here. Number one on our agenda is the approval of our June 15th minutes uh, as presented. So moved. Motion to make. Second. And second to adopt the minutes as posted. Discussion? Comments, concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are adopted. Number item number two on the list is the actual evaluation audit final results. Mr. Nelson. So um, every two years, the board adopts contribution rates for what plan two for the members and the employers and the um, state. Um, historically, the board has adopted those rates for two biennium. Um, today is the rate setting meeting for the board. We had, we had a preliminary um, view of how things were working in June. You'll have the final results from both the state actuary and from the independent actuaries element that were hired to audit the work of the state actuary. Up first will be the results of that, um, the final results of that audit. And uh, we've got a team from Milliman here to present their results. Uh, Daniel Wade, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. I think Mick is actually going to go first. Can everyone hear me at least? Yes. Good morning. All right, and I will share my screen. Share. With any luck, you're seeing our screen. Good. Yes. Great. And I'll turn it to uh, Nick. All right. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so good morning. I'm Nick Collier with Milliman. Uh, I'm here with uh, Daniel Wade and Gary uh, Deeth virtually, of course. Um, and we're here to pre present the results of the actual audit. Uh, if we move to the next page. As Tim said, you've already heard from the Office of State Actuary at the June meeting regarding the preliminary 2020. 2025 calculated contribution rates. Uh, so our main purpose of the audit is just to review and kind of put our blessing on the results of that valuation. Uh, we do that by first uh, reviewing the assumptions. Obviously, that's important because all the numbers are based upon that. Um, and this year, obviously, we spent uh, extra time looking at the economic assumptions with the new investment return, primarily to make sure those were uh, reasonable. Um, we then uh, did an independent replication of the June 30, 2021 actual valuation. So basically, we independently kind of crunched all the numbers exactly like OSA did. And then we kind of huddled, returned back and made sure everything kind of tied. And ultimately, we verified the contribution rates are reasonable. So moving to the next slide. So bottom line, uh, everything appears to be in order. Um, we had a good match on liabilities and contribution rates. Uh, obviously, when we looked at the liabilities in particular, we made sure that the new benefit formula was incorporated accurately, and we found that to be the case. Um, and just as importantly as accurate calculations, the assumptions that the those results were based upon, we found those to be reasonable. Uh, in the prior actual audit, we made a, a, a few recommendations. Those are really just minor tweaks uh, that really didn't materially affect the results, but we did confirm uh, that those recommendations were addressed by OSA in this valuation. Um, so looking forward, um, we have no changes recommended to the 2021 valuation or any future uh, valuation. So everything's looking good. So moving to the next slide. Uh, so at the June meeting, uh, Daniel and Gary talked about the actual audit process and reviewed some of the key components that go into the calculations. Uh, we've now done all the number crunching and the results, some of the key results are shown here. Uh, this table shows the present value of all future benefits, and that's for all benefits 
expect to be paid to current members. Uh, you can see three quarters of the way down for all members. We've got a whole bunch of breakdowns, uh, but just looking at kind of the bottom line there, uh, you see uh, the numbers from OSA are about 21, just under 21.1 billion. Ours are just fractionally over 21.1 billion. Uh, when you do an actual audit, you don't expect to match exactly. There's a whole lot of nuances to the calculations, but you definitely expect a high level of consistency. Uh, we expect always to be within, I'd say, 2%. Um, and if we match within 1%, so between 99 and 101%, uh, we feel good about it. At 99.7, we're very, uh, very pleased with the results, and you should feel very comfortable that uh, uh, the calculations from OSA are accurate. Uh, we also look at the entry age normal accrued liability. As you recall, uh, that's a factor in uh, what your contribution rate is. Um, because that's used in the funded ratio calculation, as you can see on the right, uh, when you round to the nearest 1%, our, our funded ratio matches exactly with OSAs. Um, and that, as I said, is a factor in the calculation of the contribution rate, which I'm gonna turn over to Daniel to talk a little bit more about the contribution rate. Great, here are our, our results for the contribution rates. When the funded ratio is under 105% based on the entry age normal actual cost method. And as Nick showed, we and the uh, Office of State Actuary had 104%. Well, under those circumstances, the contribution rates have a minimum of 100% of the EANC as we label it here. That's the normal cost under the entry age normal actual cost method. This is the method that seeks to fund the benefits as a level percentage of pay over the working lifetime of each member. And uh, just to let you know about the results, OSA calculated a normal cost of 19.89%. We had 19.88%. So obviously that was a very good match. In fact, the match was so good that once you assign 50% to the member, 30% to the employer, and 20% to the state, we, uh, we matched to the basis point. And for comparison, we have the adopted 21, 23 rates here. As you might expect, those are lower since they were based on a higher investment rate of return assumption or discount rate, and it was based on the, uh, the old benefit formula. There's one last thing I did want to mention about the contribution rates. Uh, to the extent that the contribution rate under the aggregate actual cost method would be higher than the one based on the EANC, it's our understanding that the policy uh, would be to pay that rate. I, um, we write about that method a bit in our upcoming report. We feel like it's a good method. And what it does is it takes the present value of future projected benefits, subtracts out the actual value of assets, and then divides by the present value of future salaries. And in this way, it spreads the cost over the remaining working lifetimes of the current members. As Nick showed you, we had a very good match on the present value of benefits. In June, Gary and I told you that we had a good match on the actual value of assets. And I can now report that we have a good match on the present value of future salaries, which means in turn, we have a good match on the contribution rates under that method as well. Moving ahead to the next slide in, in June, Gary and I already told you that we had a good match for both the data and the assets based on the inputs given by the DRS data and the financial data supplied by DRS as well as the uh, WSIB. Another input item for our model is the plan of benefits. We went back to the RCW and of course we studied the uh, benefit improvements under SHB 1701. For the assumptions, we went through all the demographic assumptions two years ago as part of our actual audit of the experience study. This year, there were two new assumptions that were needed to value the improvement to the benefits. The OSA made an adjustment to assume higher retirement rates at each age for those with 25 or more years of service. Now we did, like we said, well, the Office of State Actuary did, and we reviewed two years ago, a comprehensive study based on data for the rates as they stood before the benefit improvements. And now they needed to make an assumption. And the assumption that they made was that there would be more retirements for people with 25 or more years of service. That stands to reason because the higher benefits will incentivize some people to retire earlier or at a, just at a higher rate for any uh, given year. 
and we felt that the adjustments that they made were reasonable and they are in line with adjustments that we've made when benefit provisions change. The other assumption that we needed to consider was uh, how many people would take a lump sum versus how many people would take the, the better benefit formula to the extent that they had a choice there. And we found the OSA's assumption that people with more than 15 years of service take the better benefit multiplier to be a reasonable assumption. And the results really wouldn't be materially different if you had another reasonable assumption. As we discussed in June, we studied the economic, and Nick mentioned this too, we did study the economic assumptions and found them to be reasonable. We support the move to a 7% investment rate of return assumption, and that does match, as it says here, the median of the survey of large systems, and that's produced by the National Association of State Retirement Administrators. In conclusion, we recommend no changes to the contribution rates based on our analysis. We believe that the contributions and the calculations are accurate. And uh, as the first, as the final bullet shows, the uh, left two contribution rates for 23 and 25 are not to be higher than the 21, 23 rates. As, and we uh, showed those two slides ago. One last thing I would like to mention, we like to do our calculations as independently as possible from the Office of State Actuary. That said, we do need to work with their office and we find it uh, was a pleasure to work with them. And it uh, always has been basically when we've had the opportunity to work with them. And I'll turn it over to comments or uh, questions that you might have. Any questions? Not seeing or hearing any. Daniel, I want to thank you on behalf of the team here too for your excellent communications and keeping us um, apprised of how things were going, um, especially when there were uh, data issues that we were able to help out with to facilitate you getting what you needed. Um, thank you very much for a cooperative process. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. I will stop sharing. Never stop sharing. <laughs> <laughs> sharing is caring. That's right. All right. Uh, no action required for the presentation. Number three was our contribution rate setting adoption. Yeah. And that goes to Jacob. Right? Yeah. Jacob will walk you through the uh, different um, options that you have available and answer any questions that you have about uh, the rate adoption options before you. The uh, Office of the State Actuary is also available if questions get uh, technical in nature. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jacob. Good morning, Jacob. Good morning. Uh, for the record, uh, Jake White, staff to the board. Uh, the issue in front of the board today, as Steve said, is that the board may uh, choose to adopt contribution rates for the 23-25 and 25-27 biennium. Uh, first, I just wanted to go over once again what the current contribution rates are. Um, you know, you just heard a lot about this. Um, so uh, these rates were, to remind were adopted by the board based on the 2019 actuarial valuation. Uh, for the 21-23 and 23-25 biennia. Um, just once again, also as a reminder, it's 50% of uh, is paid by the member, 30 by the employer, 20 by the state. Uh, just the member rate right now is 8.53%. And I will talk more about why these rates were adopted uh, in a later slide. So as you just heard about, there's a new actuarial valuation, and that valuation, uh, along with the board funding policies, are used to guide the board in adopting the contribution rates. The key updates uh, from this valuation are the investment return assumption was lowered from 7.4 to 7%. The general salary growth assumption was lowered from 3.5 to 3 and a quarter. The investment earnings uh, had a substantial return of 31.65%. And then uh, there was the benefit uh, improvement bill, which um, updated the plan cost 
uh, including increasing uh, liabilities, and then um, uh, also updated uh, funding policy, uh, which I will go over more uh, in the upcoming slides. So uh, to use the new valuation to set the rates, the board has developed a funding goal and policies. As a reminder, the board's uh, funding goal is to have stable contribution rates. And then uh, those policies include a four-year rate adoption. Um, the board has gone with the four-year instead of two-year rate adoption, um, in, in part to help the state and employers uh, with budgeting. Uh, this allows those employers to pencil in uh, what the uh, expected contribution rate is going to be moving forward. And with the board, that um, in conjunction with the board's history of providing stable rates um, it has allowed employers to do that uh, with the level of confidence. And then uh, the minimum contribution rates, uh, which are calculated from the normal cost of entry age normal cost method. Um, so the goal of, the, of these are to have relatively stable rates uh, that don't fluctuate um, with changes in asset returns. Um, the original minimum rate policy set by the board is either 90 or 100% of the normal cost uh, based on the plan funded status. But this policy was set in statute under the benefit improvement bill and, uh, and modified. Okay, so the benefit improvement bill, uh, how, how was uh, it modified by the legislature in the benefit improvement bill? Um, first, uh, it freezes the contribution of the 23-25 contribution rates to a maximum of current rates. And so that does mean that the rates could uh, technically be lower, um, just not be higher than the current rates. Uh, and then also it created a new tier in the minimum contribution rate structure of 80%. So if the funded ratio is at least 110%, it then drops down the minimum rate to 80%. It, uh, also, the benefit improvement bill also included an offset that the board uh, put into the bill. Um, uh, it was developed with the state actuaries as part of the BIA and the funding policy uh, minimum contribution. It was developed because the, the policy minimum contribution rates uh, don't take into account the assets of the plan and only the increased liabilities of, uh, of, of members receiving the BIA which would have driven up the contribution rates um, unnecessarily, if not for having an offset. Um, so uh, if option, let's see. Um, so uh, the offset uh, would apply if uh, under, under the table there, if section one or two, the 100% or 90% um, are uh, chosen, at, um, then the offset would start applying in the 25-27 biennium and would apply for the next uh, 15 years. If the 80% um, minimum rate is chosen, then that offset does not apply. So here was an illustration uh, that I took from the actual presentation last month. I thought this was just a very simple, helpful, um, image to, to help understand how these minimum rates <clears throat> would apply um, and where that uh, new policy put in by the legislature uh, would come into play. Okay. So uh, since funded status is a measurement used to determine contribution rates, um, how did the new valuation impact uh, the plan's funded status. Uh, the funded, once again, the funded ratio is the actuarial value of assets over the accrued liabilities. Um, and the valuation included the update of economic assumptions, uh, which increased the liabilities, um, investment re returns, which increased the assets, and then the benefit improvement, which increased liabilities. And uh, that got us to where you see on this slide um, with the funded ratio. Uh, now at 104 percent. So with the 104 uh, percent funded status with the new valuation, 
um, under the board funding policy, which went over in a previous slide, um, that would equal 100% of the minimum rate, uh, which is what the board last adopted um, under the board's policy. Um, and uh, it should have, well, where are we going? Someone's taking control of my. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, in this table, we can see that uh, we would kind of ignore the aggregate rate because that doesn't come into play right now and focus in on the minimum rate. And so we can see that the minimum rate uh, should have been 7.68% following the board's funding policy. But when the board uh, adopted uh, a rate at that point, was when uh, COVID had just started. Most of the country was in some level of shutdown. It looked like the investment returns uh, might be in trouble. And um, there was lots of room for pessimism about what was going on. And so the board uh, chose to uh, move forward with 100% instead of dropping down to the board funding policy of 90%. And so that's where um, the adopted rate is at 8.53% instead of 7.68%. Um, so that's what you're seeing there. Um, and then uh, with the new valuation, um, the minimum rate uh, for 2021 would be 9.94%. However, like we talked about, um, the benefit improvement bill included a cap, the rate for the 21-23 planning and uh, at 8.53%. So um, that's just what we're seeing here. I had a question. Go ahead, sure. Yeah. Um, you know, Generally, we, we stick to that number, oh, but when legislation is passed, it might incur a cost maybe above that. Is that, is that, is that still cap us? Or let's say we do a military um, a service credit enhancement and that has some kind of impact. Would, would we still be able to adjust that rate potentially if there was a cost that we pass in the legislature like next year? So my understanding is it's capped. Wow. Um, is that look over to Steve here? But, um, in the past, supplemental rates were in addition to the rates adopted by the board. We haven't had this cap before, so that would actually be a good question in the sense of um, the bill specifically says that the board can't adopt rates higher than this number, but that might leave it open for the legislature to add additional costs on top of that. We, we'll get that. Uh, Clarified if there are any bills that would raise rates, what, what the rate impact would actually sure. be. Yes, the, the, uh, the, the caps are established by legislation. You can't find future legislatures if we need to actually have something that, of course, legislation to add the benefits of whether or not it's the board's limited this authority or not. You know, I don't see why we can't do anything in the future to adjust any of this as necessary. We're talking about Steve, you're talking about a couple of basis points, maybe if something like that happens. But if we have that, if we need to, to craft the legislation to, to waive this for that specific issue, we always have that authority. Yeah, historically, the way we play out, using the example that you just did of the military bill, which would have a couple of basis points, uh, the bill would pass and then it would come to the board to adopt the supplemental rate. And the board at that time, um, historically, for instance, has moved back to the next rate setting cycle, which would be two years from now, and the rates are not capped two years from now. So that cap is only for this particular uh, rate setting cycle. Okay. Any other questions? Go ahead. So the options in front of the board today. Uh, option one is to take no action, which would mean that the rates remain uh, at the same uh, level they are right now, but only through the 23-25 biennia, uh, because the board is not adopted for the 25-27. Um, so as I said earlier, there is a board uh, funding policy to adopt over a four-year period, uh, not two-year. Uh, and then the second uh, option would be to adopt the current contribution rate for the both the 23-25 and 25-27 biennia, um, and then reassess the 25-27 biennia uh, contribution rates uh, based on the 2023 actuarial valuation report 
um, consistent with the funding policy set in the benefit improvement bill. So there are, you see the rates are the same under uh, both options. Just to, I guess, restate option number two is historically the pattern that we've done. That's the four year adoption, correct? Yes. Yes. We got a little bit wordier uh, just to make it clear that um, the rates would be evaluated in two years consistent with the funding policy and based on the funded status at that time. There was a question that came up before the rate setting, you know, as part of this rate setting development about whether the board could project what the funded ratio would be two years from now, you know, for the next biennium, and then maybe adopt rates for that biennium based on that projection. Um, but in discussions with the actuary, that's um, um, is it inconsistent with the board's past practice? It's uh, probably not best practices from an actuarial sense as well. So, uh, but calling it out that it's just a reminder, even though your setting rates might be setting rates for the 25 27 biennium today, like you have in the past, you have another rate setting option between when those go into effect to adjust them as you feel is appropriate. So before us, two options. Discussion, questions? It, it, just, just to share, okay, I'm, I'm gonna be dumb on this one. So I'm, I'm looking at both and the, the net result of both is, is a net that's identical. I mean, it's a process question you're talking about between one and two over quite frankly, with number one, we'd end up having to revisit in two years. With number two, and, and, and that would probably be based upon the 2023 actual evaluation. With number two, we do the same thing anyway, but we're just calling it out. Is that correct? Yeah. The, the, the practical difference between the two is that there actually is a number for 2527 that budget writers could plug in that's been adopted as opposed to and I know I guess it what that number would be, et cetera, that might be adjusted. So, uh, so we're, we're giving them a benchmark to play from yes, this sort of kind of sort of. And that was the purpose yeah. of the four year rate setting was to give that benchmark because it's always, like you said, it's always subject to review. Right. But at least there's something that, uh, to, as, a, and as Jacob has mentioned, based on your track record of stable rates that has been something that they can have been able to rely on with some uh, significant degree of success. So, so the net outcome is the same, but the number two actually is a process and allows everybody uh, position to manage that. That yeah. being said, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I move to option number two. Okay, motion is made, made to adopt option number two. Is there a second? Second. second. <laughs> Got it. So second to me. Discussion? Any questions or questions? So I would have a question for the employer representatives um, in this term and to get their opinion about it. Is this helpful from their perspective as an employer? I'm obviously yes. a member of the representative, so I was going to ask and see what, what they were thinking about that. Well, you want to? Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, this is Wolf. Thank you. Um, this is very helpful to us. Uh, we, of course, at Pierce County budget on a biennial basis, but when we budget, we also look out four and six and uh, potentially eight years, depending on the circumstances. So rate stability, at least as we would benchmark it today, knowing that there's a chance we would revisit in a couple of years is, is quite helpful in that respect. This is Jay. I'll just echo uh, Wolf's comments. Although we don't budget by an, by, by on a biannual basis in Olympia, it is helpful to be able to look out several years and have some stability um, to see that. So this is very helpful for us. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Wolf. Any other questions or comments? Not for me. No. Uh, seeing, uh, seeing no other comments, uh, for us, we have the motion to adopt number two. All those in favor, aye. Aye. 
Opposed? Option two is adopted. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Jacob. Sure. Number four on our, our list is the 2023-2025 biennial budget adoption. And Mr. Valencia. Good morning, Tim. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, Tim Valencia, uh, Deputy Director for the Left 2 Board. Uh, this item is the 23-25 biennial budget. Um, this really is, is what you might consider the, the start of this process, but it's an important step uh, for the uh, board to uh, approve our, our planned uh, spending plan uh, for, for the next biennium. And this is for a budget that will actually start a year from now. Um, so by way of background, uh, when the board was created, an expense fund account was created, Fund 548, and, and that is where all of the funding uh, it comes from, basically the trust fund, to pay for all the expenses of the board itself. Now, Fund 548 is not appropriated in the budget process through the legislature, but it is an allotted account, meaning that it's a statement of our proposed expenditures, and it is subject to review and approval by the Office of Financial Management. So with this spending plan that we put together for the 2325 uh, biennia, um, this we will submit to OFM in September, uh, which is why you're, you're approving it today. Um, and that will then go into the budget process during the next legislative session. And then a final you know, budget will come out because there's a possibility that things will be adjusted, uh, you know, sent services or, or you know, we expect there may be some actuarial service uh, charge changes. Those things will be changed in the budgetary uh, process. So we would come back to you after the legislative session uh, with a, call a, a final or an adjusted budget for the 23-25 uh, uh, biennium. Uh, again, this will be for a budget starting in July of 23 um, and running through June of 2025. So the design of this budget um, it is, all, is focused on ensuring that the board can conduct all of its business, all the expenditures that are necessary for you to be able to meet your fiduciary responsibilities. So things, you know, both clearly as the expenses regarding holding board meetings and, and making sure you can attend the board meetings, uh, all the member and stakeholder communications that we conduct, uh, whether it's us going to the member conferences, the newsletters, all the various ways we communicate with them, professional development, which means for trustees to be able to attend uh, educational conferences, but also for the staff to be able to attend uh, educational opportunities and maintain professional certifications. Um, the, uh, all the various contracts that, that we utilize for services, uh, actuarial services, uh, uh, Ice Miller for, for uh, legal counsel and, and tax counsel, uh, things of that nature, um, and then our general agency operations. So actually just operating the, the agency itself, which of course is the buildings, the utilities, the staffing, you know, supplies, everything that we need to actually physically run in all of this. So all of those things, uh, everything in this budget touches, you know, something in that area, which is what allows us to operate as an agency. So this is the actual proposed spending plan. It's in the same format, if you will, or the same categories that you see on the quarterly uh, budget uh, reports. Uh, and as you, so I will say on the right, column, you'll see the, the percentage of the total budget um, each category represents. This is consistent um, with the spending over the last four uh, biennia. Uh, so there's really no major departures in terms of where the money is being spent. And then we've always been very close on the budget. We've never been um, over budget other than things like where we had to go for a decision package for items like move and whatnot. Um, but we've always been able to, to live within uh, the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the budget amount that's been allocated. Um, as expected, salaries and wages and benefits, um, as with almost any employer, is the largest um, expense that we have. Uh, for the state actuary services, we do expect that there will be, just due to inflation, some changes next biennium in, in the amount 
Uh, we pay the actuary's office, uh, but that will be something that we will look to uh, have adjusted in the, in the next budget cycle when we go for supplementals that we need to make an increase in the amount of money we need there. Um, but otherwise, the, the um, you know, rent and utilities, uh, the state central services, that's a large category because we contract out for a lot of services from other state agencies, uh, specifically Department of Enterprise Services um, and uh, WATEC, which is kind of the, the, the technical uh, branch. Uh, and so that's why we're able to do a lot of things without having to hire a lot more staff. They do our accounting, uh, they do all of our technology through the technology application, um, you know, HR, uh, payroll. So all of those, those centralized services they conduct for us. Um, and then of course, I already mentioned the staff and trustee professional uh, development in there. Um, so uh, these are all the areas that we are going to plan to spend on. So this is the plan that I am asking the board to approve today and that we will submit uh, to OFM through the budget process. Any questions on any of the spending plan? Questions for Tim? A question, just a comment that uh, <clears throat> all this money comes out of the plan yeah. and it's not, a, uh, it's not uh, from the general fund of the state. Correct. Not a general fund ex expense. That is correct. All of this, all of the expenses come out of the trust fund and go into that 548, um, and they are not appropriated from the general trust fund. Thank you. That's a good point. So before us is uh, the biennial budget for adoption. I'd entertain a motion. Motion to adopt. To adopt. Second. Second. Discussion. Seeing and hearing that. All in favor of the adoption of the 2023 2025 closed spending plan, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Plan is adopted. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Mr. Nelson. All right. We've got a couple of things to cover on the administrative update. Uh, you guys have been extraordinarily efficient in taking care of your business today. And I hopefully won't change that. Um, Why do you keep saying that? You throw it out in the universe every day. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, as far as outreach, uh, there was the uh, State Council of Firefighters had their, their annual conference uh, late last month. Um, Deputy Director Valencio was present there for the board. We had a table there where he was able to answer questions and uh, uh, feedback was members. It couldn't get any better than Tim. Yeah. And they were thankful that he showed up and they don't remember having such a great presence there. Well, I'll pass it on to, uh, <laughs> to Tammy, who was at the last one. But also, no, I would, yeah, uh, you'd be surprised how often Tim gets that feedback when he's coming after me. And, um, I try, I don't take it personally, um, but yeah. Um, that was good to have him. Mr. Nelson, take all in consideration that fire when they have their councils in the meetings, you should have a horse to bar. <laughs> Usually. Um, so that, uh, the, uh, again, that was June. We don't have anything at this point in time uh, scheduled for July or August to give you a heads up about as far as the future. One thing I wanted to talk to you about, uh, remind all of you, we have an annual process where I meet with each of you individually to find out how things are going and to it's specifically to find out from you, what your individual expectations are for support from us over the upcoming year. Um, that process is ready to get going. Jesse's going to start reaching out to all of you to set up a time. Historically, that was always done personally and in your home turf. Uh, that tended to make things comfortable and feedback, it, it made it, uh, the, the, those discussions tended to be very easy then, and we were able to, uh, as far as open. Uh, the, the feedback was 
always easy, but um, but the, you know the, it facilitated those kind of uh, open discussions. Since COVID, we moved to um, those all being done remotely. My personal, just so that you guys know, I'm I'm uh, vaccinated and I have my shots. And if your would like to meet in person, I am willing to do that. Uh, that'll be kind of your call. Um, but that'll be part of what Jesse works out with each of you um, as we get go start getting these set up. Uh, we like to have those results usually done in time for Tim to report to you at the October meeting. So we try to have them done by the end of September um, for the very early part of uh, October. The next meeting is scheduled for August 24th. Um, as you recall, when we adopted, when you adopted the um, schedule, we reminded you that historically the August meetings had been canceled. If there was determined at that time that the board's work plan was on track and there wasn't a need for that meeting, uh, based on today's meeting, I can say that your work plan is on track and there's no recommendation from staff that there's a need for the August meeting. Um, that being said, it will take a motion of the board to cancel that meeting if that's your will and that uh, we would go about notifying the stakeholders and the co-provisor's uh, office and stuff so that, that formal board schedule could be uh, edited to show the cancellation. Billy in the group? So moved. Right. Is there a second? Second. Second. Motion is made and second to cancel our August meeting. Is there discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Our August meeting has been canceled. The next scheduled meeting for the board then would be September 28th. Right. Um, we will be in touch with you ahead of time. Um, the initial plan for the state investment board for this space was that they would be ready to open up to allow um, some access by the public and attendance by the public at the meetings. There, that's still the plan, although it is, of course, being evaluated. And you guys have tracked the COVID news as much as, you know, as much as we do about um, how, how things are changing. And so there is a possibility that um, things could change, and we will let you know. It's also expected that uh, by September, the SID will be using slightly different technology for the board room and so the way you sign in to board meetings and stuff may be different they're trying to move to a team's environment and uh, we will um, be in uh, provide you with all the updated instructions as necessary in advance of the september meeting so be looking uh, in, in september be looking for information from us about what that meeting will look like, both from a technology and from a, a public attendance standpoint. Uh, that concludes my administrative update, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you very much. Is there anything else before our group? Wolf has his hand up. Who does? Oh, Wolf, sorry, go ahead. The hand oh, the oh, yeah, oh, thank you so much. Um, just a quick uh, offer to Steve, as uh, you and others may engage with uh, SIB and, and DES, WATEC on uh, moving to teams. Uh, our experience at the county has been very, very good and positive in the use of teams for predictable, regular, and even irregular meetings of internal groups, but has not been as successful uh, when used as a public engagement or public meeting tool. Uh, Zoom has been a much better tool for us, uh, much more 
uh, adaptable and amenable to the public engagement kinds of meetings that the left to board usually conducts. So if you need additional feedback beyond that, I see heads shaking, uh, nodding in agreement. Uh, uh, happy to provide that separately uh, so that we don't end up uh, in a situation that replicates our initial experience early in the pandemic when we found teams to be inadequate in the public engagement space. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Well, one of the things that SIB is evaluating is that exact point that you mentioned about um, the public engagement piece and being able to manage that uh, successfully. They, there is an expectation that Teams is going to have some updates between now and September that will hopefully allow it to be more successful than it has been or was earlier. And I think part of what we're waiting to see is, does that actually happen? And is SIB able to test it ahead of time to where they feel comfortable moving? Uh, we won't be moving ahead of them. If they're not ready to, or if Teams isn't ready in September, then we'll stick with Zoom. Uh, but uh, they're not, the SIB is not gonna move until they've tested it and are comfortable that it works for their public engagement piece. And at that point in time, it'll, it'll be what we have here as well. Great, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anything else for the group? Yes, sir, Mark, they just, Point of personal privilege sure. is uh, some people are more uh, confident with technology than others, and I, you know, the, the past three years have been very difficult. I've been on the board since the very beginning, and I have found it very, very uh, productive to have people in the same room at the same time to establish and maintain relationships, especially because the board is comprised of members, employer representatives, and state legislators. So from my perspective, I would just try to encourage everybody to come and uh, sit in the same room at the same time, as often as possible as your schedules will allow, and to meet the new board members and to establish relationships. I think it's been a very functional way that the board has operated over the last 22 years. So. I would just encourage people, if you can, to uh, come and sit with the staff, come and sit with uh, the other board members. And uh, I think it's been very helpful and very functional over the long term. Thank you, Mark. Mr. Shearer, just to, to follow up on that, if I may. Sure, please. Uh, uh, I am 100% with you on that, Mark. The, uh, half the conversations occur in the hallway before or after a meeting where issues are resolved or consensus obviously is built on a topic and explanations given that that's in far more detail that would be available during the course of the meeting. Uh, and it's not just a phone call before or after. A lot of times you don't know what's arising in front of you until you find out uh, all being together in the same room. There's a, a solid 50% of communication that's missing in a virtual environment sure that that, uh, that this sometimes is, is the deal maker, deal breaker in, in, in policy moving forward here that, that is even above and beyond the personal relationship aspects. So you're kind of forwarding the people that, that, that Mark is addressing here. That there's, there's much more to that. I, I have to affirm this position. I, I think it makes most sense and it's most productive for us to be in the same room together. Okay. Anything else from the group? <clears throat> Right. Not seeing anything, nothing on the agenda. Our work has been completed. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. So move. So move. <laughs> I got real nervous there for a second. It's certainly my favorite. What am I missing? We don't want to go. Nobody wants to go. We like being together in person. That's right. All right. We have a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Second. All right. All those in favor of adjourning and uh, reconvening in September. Please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. We are adjourned until September 28th. Thank you. Thanks for your time this morning.